deepest, darkest North Essex on the border with Cambridgeshire, between Essex and, and Cambridgeshire, with Dave Binns and Gary Lamin, who you'll have seen before in a video where we went out to uh, Hertfordshire to look at um, a burial mound and a housing estate in Pinehurst. And Dave is going to take us somewhere very special today, Dave, aren't you? Yeah, this is Bartlow, and importantly, I think, we're, we're, we're on the borderlands. We're on the modern borderlands between two counties, Cambridgeshire, Essex. Now, Bartlow is not a well-known place. Uh, it's, it has one of the most extraordinary prehistoric monumental sites in, in Britain, which include the largest burial mound in this country. These are rather special mounds. They're built under the period, they're built in the period, sorry, in the period of Roman occupation. They're a little bit different from the kind of mounds that people interested in these things are more familiar to seeing. They're less rounded, they're more conical, they're more pointed. This was very much the Roman style, except it wasn't really Roman style. This is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more, I hope, when we reach the site itself. This is the biggest burial mound in Britain. It's, there's a slight element of debate which involves Silbury Hill, which is of course bigger, considerably bigger. But there's no proof for that though, Dave, of being a burial mound, is there? Exactly. Yeah. That's the whole point. It's a different type of structure. Exactly. Yeah. And there are different interpretations as to what it actually was. Yeah. But there's. Uh, but, th but this we know is a definite burial ground. It is. It is a burial ground. But we have to be careful because. Look, you go into any Christian cathedral, you'll find bodies there, but it's not just a place to bury people. It's a place of worship, it's a place of historical perspective, it's a place of... of respect. Of respect, of, of, of ethnicity as well. Yeah. So these, we cannot assume they were simply convenient places for bodies. They would have had symbolic significance. Yes. They would have been about... Um, they would have been about conceptions of, of lineage, of where we're coming from, of who we belong to, but also power plays. Yeah. And a because conception of being and, and, and things that have been yep. and possibly will be after. Yeah, but the power plays are very important that yeah. I mentioned because a fraction of the population were buried in these kinds of circumstances. Yeah. This was a display... Was this a, was this a bit of aristocratic? Then? Yes. Okay. These, these were some kind of local nobility. All oh, right, OK. This is a statement then? This is a statement. Oh, got gotcha. you. Just as in the Nothing earlier much changes period. then, really, Dave. Nothing much like changes. It. <laughs> yeah. um, it was a differentiated society. It had been before the Romans came, yeah. and that was consolidated and probably exacerbated in various ways. All right. And, 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 and stabilised. Should we get, get, get in and have a little bit of a closer look? Let's do, because the closer you go, the bigger they become. <laughs> Burial yeah. they're, they're kind of domed. It's definitely breast like. It's, they, look at them. Mother Earth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, it's hard not to. Uh, and just, I mean, the curvature is, 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 is female. Yeah, definitely. The, well, originally, they were, as far as is known, they were the largest group of Roman barrows in Northern Europe. So this was, this, this was significant, it, was, it would have been known, I'm sure it would have been known in Rome. Yeah. And I wonder why, Dave, I wonder why that here, why they made them this big here. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be a lot of knowledge about the actual people who lived here. There's, the reading that I have done suggests that they were very comfortable people rather than hyper affluent so it doesn't look like a monarchy okay. or anything resembling anything resembling that sure. um, i think the romans were rather adept the roman imperial power was rather adept where they weren't pushed too far at, oh, at, at integrating local right. hierarchies okay. so they they gave them a, a, the, the romans would have gave these people a lot of respect then I think so, so long as they didn't fight. Yeah, as long as they behaved themselves, they could sort of From go the about Roman their sort of day-to-day -day stuff pretty unhindered. I think there was a lot of that. 
Yeah. Um, though again, there's a lot we don't know. They're generally called Romano-British. Oh, right, but yeah. that raises a number of questions. How Romano were they? How British were they? In fact, were they in any sense British? In any meaningful sense? I mean, Britain was not actually a nation state. Britain had not been a nation state when it was occupied by Rome. It was a num there were a number of tribal chieftains. This is the climb up to the top of the biggest burial mound in Britain, here at Bartlow Hills. Dave, we're now at the top of yeah. the biggest burial mound. Right. And I think I'm right in saying we're still in Essex. We're just in Essex, aren't we? We're just inside Essex on the border, virtually on, uh, the, on the border. On the border with Cam Cambridgeshire. Yeah. Okay. Now, when I think of Essex, I don't I don't think of it as a place of of hills. I always think of Essex as fairly flat. And yet when I look round this landscape here, this is this is very this is very very hit, very hilly around here, isn't it? Very hilly. For Essex, it's extremely hilly. And it, you're right, it is, it is unusual. I'm not a professional archaeologist. My guess would be that it, it's not accidental. And It's not accidental that these, these burial mounds have been... They've chose to build the, the, them here. Absolutely, that they've decided to create this kind of humanised space. If you want to call it spiritually humanised, whatever. It... it, it, it the, the hills that you're pointing to give this area a, or this locality, give, give it a very distinctive quality in relation to the wider area that oh, we now you. know as Essex and into Cambridgeshire yeah. as a yeah. whole. Yeah. And if you, if you think about it, you, you, you've already, you already have, with these hills, existing mounds, existing yeah. vertical irregularities, what you could call them, yeah. within the landscape. And even more prominent ones are being created through these mounds. So they're mirroring the, the, the area. There's a kind of creative mirroring. It's an amplifying as well, well as a amplifying mirroring. Amplifying of the area, yeah. But yeah. yeah, but it is mirroring. You're, you're, you, this is this kind of, And I, I think they would have been conscious of this. They're a lot of thought, a lot of care. There's a lot of history and even prehistory behind the building of these, these kind of okay. structures. And there's something else that has to be taken into account as well. Even though Look, I mean, a mound is not a flat grave. It, it's a very different kind of visual yeah. phenomenon, uh, an, an experiential phenomenon. Yeah. Flat graves, in a sense, you know, look a little bit more than levelled ground. This is striking. Yeah. This is a display of social prominence. They've, they've built this here as a communal status of some form of hierarchy. Yeah, it's all about hierarchy, or it's largely about hierarchy. Right, right. I mean, I should be wary of a statement like it's all about, because it may have been about a whole number of things. They had a lot in common with the flat graves. The archaeologists, archaeologists who I mentioned, Cyril Fox. Cyril Fox, yeah, you did mention him. He points out that there's, there are a number of things in common between the burials inside this type of structure and in the Roman flat graves, both of them have wooden caskets oh, yeah. where the remains are kept inside a stone oh, yeah. structure, basically a building. And is that what would be inside this? That is what was found inside here. So, so these have been excavated then? They've think? been excavated. Okay. Unfortunately, in the mid 19th century, most of the finds were destroyed accidentally in a fire. So it's gone. But they were documented, so we know what they were. And they were fine goods. They were elite goods. They were, they were jewellery. They were, they, were, they were symbolic state you know, so we materials. Know that, so we know that the, that the people that were buried in, in, in these burial mounds were of some kind of uh, money background. Or, or Yes, they were socially prominent right. individuals and families, and possibly groups of families. Yeah. I mean, it may well be that each of well, these mounds land, corresponded... Well, land, land owners or something like that? You can't really say. It's difficult to say precisely what the source of their money was. Yeah. Presumably they would have owned land whatever the source of their money. That yeah. was the nature yeah. of the society, I think. Yeah. So what, what you had... I mean, Cyril Fox, at any rate, suggests that what you had was some kind of cultural continuity from an earlier period, which essentially means the Iron Age 
reaching back into the Bronze Age, being perhaps after an interval, perhaps continuously, but either being restored or perpetuated oh, yeah. in the later period. Okay. So it, it's very, very interesting. Oh, so, because so, that, so there was an inf influence from the two sort of transcending periods. So yes, yes, and this is important because a traditional view is that really Britain become became kept my ten stride. Britain became thoroughly Romanized. Now it may not have been quite that thorough. Or there may have been a little bit of give and take both ways, even. And we don't know what ca exactly what kind of belief systems the people who built these, the people who were buried in them, the people who either worshipped or paid tribute at them. We don't know for sure what their beliefs were. And their beliefs were probably as complex and multidimensional as ours. I want to put it in context, the historical context, and think of some events that we know about. These mounds were the archaeologists the archaeological consensus is they were raised around 100 AD. It's a very important time, it's a very delicate time. From a point of view of Roman power, it was a period of sustained subduing of the areas sustained of... Sustained subduing? Sustained, sustained subduing, subduing of the population right. of Britain, the parts of Britain that they had occupied. Was so it, could there have been a, a, you know, a little bit of an insurgence on the go at this time as well, possibly? Well, there had been a major insurgence shortly before. Uh, if you go back just half a century before these were built, you have two major events taking place which, which were fundamental. On. You had the final destruction of the core of the Druid. Okay. Cada. Okay. In and the Romans didn't like the Druids, did they? Well, they resisted. Yeah. This happened in Anglesey. The showdown was in Anglesey. Right. And around the same time, you had an uprising in this region, famously led by Queen Boudicca. Okay. And she gathered the Iceni tribes and, and uh, the Iceni tribe and, 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 and various local tribes in this massive display of resistance. And some historians still believe she could almost have won, except the Romans couldn't allow. It to happen. Okay. Okay. But the, the scale of resistance was as intense yeah. as it happened in Palestine. Yeah. Consider that that was only around half a century before these were built. Now, it's very difficult to say what thoughts, what memories of those events and the significance of those events was held by the people here. So there may have been undercurrents of nostalgia, which might lead, you know, Boudicca may well have been a, still have been a heroine figure for some people. Others may have gone over more fully to the Roman yeah. point of view that, that backwardness had been subdued, that the imperial might had been imposed for everyone's good, ultimately, as they saw it. We don't know. Other people may have been hovering between those two positions. All kinds of ambiguity. We cannot say. Edging their bets and that kind of thing. Yeah, and genuinely unsure because yeah. they were on new terrain. Yeah. And who is so sure? Perhaps being sure, absolutely crystal clear under those circumstances might be a sign of weakness rather than anything else because it suggests that you're not really looking at the nuances of the situation and the possibilities that it opens up. Would there have been like a, a chamber in the middle of what would the structure, the internal structure yeah. of the mound being like? There was a brick structure, in a sense a brick mini building you could call it, and inside that there would have been a wooden casket, and this is what contained, or a series of wooden caskets, this is what contained the remnants. But there's something else which is truly extraordinary. And I've written about this in an article, actually, which I do intend to revive shortly and re redraft in, in some respects, because something else was found inside these graves. And this is reported in the archaeology. What they found was a series of metal lamps. And beside them were amounts, smallish amounts of what appeared to be burnt wax. And also the candles uh, the candles. It, it, all the indication was, every indication was, and there seems to be no doubt about this, that the that as the tomb was sealed, the lights were left burning. Now, yeah. <sighs> this can be interpreted in various ways. The light 
is continuing after the closure. A little bit of an Egyptian sort of theme there, carrying that on a little, to, to the next world. It could well be. Is this an indication of the belief in the continuity of a metaphor for light consciousness? Or light as a yeah. consciousness, or a metaphor for light? Yes. Into the future. So even though these people are gone, there's some kind of continuity, or presumably the, the, the people who did this would know that the lights were going to go out in a certain amount of time. So is it another, is it also perhaps a recognition of mortality, that light eternal, is ultimately extinguished? Yeah. yeah, but they may have been also working with the idea that it isn't an eternal light that it may be a light for a period, there may be a transition period, but the light will go out. We don't know how to interpret this. I don't know how to interpret this, but it obviously had importance. People left, people deliberately, consciously left um, lamps, burning. lamps burning as they sealed the tombs. Dave, why do you think the uh, burial mounds are situated here? Because we don't appear to be near any major Roman towns or cities. Yeah. Uh, also, there's no. Are we near a major Roman road of any description? What would have been the kind of significance of this location, yeah. either tribally uh, to the to the to the British tribes or to yeah. the Romans? It wasn't. I'm, I'm, I, can, I think I can say confidently that it, it wasn't in any sense a, a major urban centre. I mean, it wasn't the Colchester. It wasn't the London. On the other hand, a lot of Roman Britain, what we call Roman Britain, was quite dispersed. So there are, still, there are debates that have emerged the last 10 or 20 years. We used to talk quite casually about villas, Roman villas, which were relatively distinct, separated, not perhaps quite isolated, but they were in country locations. It's now felt that a good number of these may actually have been temples. But even so, the picture I have is still of, of, a, of a generally quite dispersed population and there would have been local ruling groups. The heirs in many senses of the tribal leaderships and this is important the concept of tribe because I think I mentioned earlier Cyril Fox the, the, the archaeologist he, he spoke of, of these mounds that the fact that they are mounds that this is a cultural form with some continuity back into the Iron Age, into the Bronze Age and so on. And this is into a time that we call tribal organisation. There are, there are debates as to whether the tribes of that period were exactly the same as the tribes of now and I, I'm not even going to try to, to, go, to go into that. But it is known that the Iceni tribe, the people we call, were known as the Iceni, Boudicca's, Boudicca's tribe, they were very close to this area. Their, their, their heartlands were just a little bit northeast from here. So you, you, you had tribal territories which were in some respects carried over into the Roman period, the Roman domination period, um, under Roman auspices and, and adjustments going on perhaps both ways. Cyril Fox, the, the, the archaeologist, he definitely speaks about the continuity of an earlier cultural form in terms of the mound building, but points out then that, well, it seems unlikely that there was actually a different rite, a different burial rite, a different, if you like, theological rite or spiritual rite, R-I-T-E, involved because of this element of the commonality of the architecture within these very, very visibly, outwardly visibly different types of, 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 of entity. The, the, the mound on the one hand and the flat grave on the other hand, they had a lot in common. Do they know why, is there any reading, Dave, as to why this one is much larger than the surrounding ones? No, I don't know. Uh, it, it could be that it was the most prominent family. The, these, right. Each one of these may have been associated with, I mean, some archaeologists assume this, I believe, but each one of them may have been associated with a particular family. A particular um, and maybe in that family. case, in the smaller ones, they might, might have been like the sort of minions of these people that, that were buried here. Possibly, or simply lesser nobility. So we're talking about something deeply transitional, transitional 
in terms of there are Roman features here and there are pre-Roman tribal features here as well. And it's very, very difficult to disentangle from that complex what the actual thoughts of particular people in the situation were. Yeah. My guess was the thoughts were intention in actually relationship of attention with each other yeah. in the same people. Yeah. Um, and it may have meant different things at different times. Yeah. This is this is like the, this is like the dark Magus jazz album of Miles Davis, throwing it all in there and finding out where it settles. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Okay. And leaving something that lasts a long, long time yeah. and that is yeah. remembered. A Decipher long time. that if you can. I'm working on it. <laughs> no, the dark Magus. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to remember that we, we think of archaeology. It is a science, or there's a scientific basis to it, but. Compared, if we think of Britain, the, the, the number of, of, of sites, prehistoric sites, let alone sites of interest to archaeologists from, from later periods, there are so many sites and so few archaeologists that a lot of work has not been done. And I think almost all of it, I mean, Avebury, Stonehenge, major discoveries are still being made. We can assume that many sites, including this one, probably has more undiscovered than is discovered. We, we, we just don't know. There are traces of buildings which have been interpreted in different ways. There's a lot we don't know. We don't really know very much about the pre-Roman period. There are a few coins, a few items like that have been found. But I think that if systematic research could be done, possibly, uh, you know, non-intrusive archaeology, non-invasive archaeology, then there'd be, there'd, be a lot, there'd be a lot to discover. Who, know, who knows what we're standing on now? Or who we're standing on now? I, if we're going to understand the modern world, I think we need to at least make an attempt to understand how what arguably was the first step toward modernity through the Neolithic revolution or counter-revolution, depending how we interpret it, and the earthworks, the new level of earthwork production, which emerged in the course of that, and in some examples preceding that as well. Uh, there are clues, that there are clues in these kind of sites, in the earlier sites, back into the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the, 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 the Neolithic, of new social configurations, new political configurations emerging, embryonic ruling class and state organisation developing, because, you know, clearly these were products of collective labour. Um, think of <laughs> Avebury, think of Stonehenge, over, over a long period. Um, so I think they're definitely part of the, you could call it the armoury of evidence that we need to look at to make sense of how we got here, how we got where we are in this, what I would interpret as a declining class system for which we're paying seriously because this is the origin this is the origin or close to the origin of the emergence of class society and the state which of course have both come through various forms subsequently but forms which are posited on this initial uh, shift into into new degrees and types of, of, of hierarchy because that's what we're actually seeing we're seeing the evidence of social hierarchy the, the, these are not for regular people, if you like. These are elite environments. Entry into these areas may well have been severely restricted, more restricted than it is now, at least we have a footpath to come into. It may have been quite dangerous to enter these areas, if, 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 if I'm correct, and that degree of exclusivity was actually enforced on the population as a whole. And we are talking about processes that do involve enforcement, we're talking about class, class society.